right, so advanced attacks, they call these. These are not super advanced attacks, but anyway, they're a little bit more advanced than what we talked about before. So denial of service is just anything that makes the system unavailable to legitimate users. Um, it can be as simple as blowing up with a bomb or turning off the power, but the ones we think about more are the more common and less extreme ones where you send undesirable network traffic. A DOS is typically from one source. DDoS is an distributed DOS from many sources all conspiring together. Um, so it's based, uh, the same flood is the most common kind of denial of service, even now. This is a simple layer four attack. And the point is, if you flood the network with any kind of traffic at all, that can create a denial of service if you just use up all the bandwidth in the line. But it's more efficient to send SYN packets because each SYN means the server has to send a SYN act back and then it has to wait for their corresponding act. So somehow the server has to remember which SYN acts are waiting. And the simplest way to do that involves keeping them all in memory and then you run out of memory if you get too many SYNs. So SYN flood is more effective than others. And let me just show you some SYN floods here. They're very easy to make with Scapy. Um, so I set up a simple I'm running Scapy here, which you've done in the projects, and if you do I dot uh, display to show the layer three structure I've got here, um, I'm just going to send it to 11143. Uh, I sent it to 11129, and 11129 is my Windows machine here. All right, this guy is 11. No, oh. all right, must have left it. No, that source is 143. Right, line. Destination is 129. It must be my Linux machine. Let's go to that. I got a lot of machines running here. All right. This one here is ifconfig. Actually, about that window. I need another window. ifconfig. This machine is 11129. Okay. Machine 11129 is where I'm sending things. And if I do the uh, t.display, I'll see the layer 4 information. And that shows that my target port is www, which is port 80. That's wrong. It's port, I started this machine listing on port 23. Uh, no, sorry, that is it. Good. I, so what I did was I started worldwide web listing here. And you can tell, because if I do netstat minus an pipe more on my Linux machine, I can see what's listing, and it's listing on port 80. Okay, so I started a web server. This thing is handing out a web page. So all I have to do is send sins to there. So what I've done is I've set up a TCP flag S, it's a SYN packet, and what I have to do is increment the source port. I started it at 1100 earlier, like Windows XPU, and then send it to that destination port. So I wrote just a one-liner to do that there. This adds one to the source port and sends the packet, layer three and layer four. So to see the effect on the Linux machine, I'm just running watch, netstat minus n minus t minus p TCP. That will show me the connections with numbers, um, for TCP, and I forgot what the PHP does. Oh, uh, protocol, TCP, TCP, and minus T, um, I forget what minus T does, but anyway, I figured out that. So that shows the things on the uh, connections. So if I just run this every, about as fast as I can hit the button, there they come. So I'm sending a lot of SINs, and it's creating a lot of what's called half open connections at the other end. Send a little faster, you'll see more of them. Yep. So that's what happens. These, each one of these means the Linux machine has to burden itself remembering those half open connections, and that's what makes this work. The same thing applies to Windows machines. I've got a Windows virtual machine here. This one is a Telnet listener, listing on port 23, and its IP address, uh, let me find it. If I go here and here, do IF, IP config, type more. It's 11.142, okay. 11.142, so I need to change the IP destination to 192.168.11.142. And this is not a web server, it's a telnet server, so I need to change the t.d port to 23 for telnet. And now, supposedly, the same thing will work um, there. Yep, there we go. I send a lot of half-open telnets, and I get some piled up the other end. So as you can see, it's burdening that machine. And um, it's just a question of your timeouts and how fast you're sending them. But other things being equal, these SYN floods are more effective at wasting resources than things like ICMB floods and UDP floods.
Oh, can, can you say multiple packets at once? Send it to send it one? Uh, yes. There's no reason you can't. I mean, your wire can only technically send one at a time, but you can send them out very fast. You can send thousands or tens of thousands per second. It's just a measure of how fast your machine is. Are you using a bridge? Uh, these are all in NAT mode right now. But it doesn't matter as long as they can see each other. Good. Anyway, so that's the joy of this in flood, and that's what low lowered ion can does and a whole lot of other t uh, attack tools do. The one that I'm always used to take down MasterCard and such. Um, so if you want to perfect yourself from these, there are simple ways to do it. For example, if you do what I just did and you attack from a single machine, then all they have to do is block that IP address. They set their firewall to throw away any traffic coming from you. That's all um, Lawrence Berkeley Labs does. They had a guy come here and talk to them. They used to have firewalls with normal firewall rules, but they threw them away and switched to Bro. Bro is their intrusion de detection system, and this is all they do. If anybody sends an attack packet, Bro blocks them for a brief period of time, like half an hour. That's all they do, and they say at any given time they have about 50,000 IPs blocked, and they're able to keep their network up just fine that way. That stops the attacks well enough. This is more or less what Cloudflare does, too. Anyway, so if you uh, see an IP address sending junk, you can block it. Uh, you can change your half-open connection so it times out faster, because normally a half-open connection on Linux waits for about two minutes, on Windows it only waits about 30 seconds. Um, if you do that, you will waste less RAM on the attack traffic, but you'll also lose some real users with things like unreliable mobile devices that keep dropping out and actually time out for a really legitimate customer. Send cookies are another way. Um, instead of storing the in trying to, trying to remember what acknowledgement numbers you're waiting for in RAM, you can use something like your own IP address and use a cryptographic function to encode that in the ACK number. And then you can recognize ACK numbers that came from your server without having to remember them. Really all this does is mean you spend a little bit more processor time calculating each SYN ACK, but you don't have to use as much RAM waiting for it. So it's a trade-off. You avoid having a RAM overuse, but you increase your chance of running out of CPU. And most DOS attacks actually work by exhausting CPU. Anyway, um, but SYN cookies are considered a defense against this. Yeah? What did you use to block the source IP address? Oh, the firewall. Yeah, but you didn't have a firewall rule added. And so you write, and that's what an IDS is really. An IDS watches for attack traffic, and when it comes in, it then puts in a firewall rule. This, by the way, is what my web host, one and one does. Every now and then I have students that try to take down my website, or more or less, not that I mind too much, but I have students to try to try their attacks against my website, and what happens is they get blocked off my website for about a half hour. Oh, I don't want people doing that too much, or my web hosting might get mad at me. I have a special server just to be attacked. That's attack.samsclass.info. That's where you're supposed to practice attacks. But anyway, um, all right. So a smurf attack is another one. A smurf attack is packet amplification. If you send a ping to a broadcast address, then there was a time when all the machines in the whole network would respond to you. Um, this was true of the City College Wireless Network until a couple months ago, but it's not true of very many networks. Almost every modern network has figured this out and blocked it. But um, in, the old, in the old days, maybe 10 years ago, this was quite common. So you could just send a ping to a broadcast address like, uh, let me see if I can get the normal toolbar here. Uh, there we are. So City College, if I do my IF config, yeah, yeah, IF config, okay. So I am 147, 144, 195, 20. And the network mask of this particular network is 255, 255, 240, it's a slash 20 if you've done your Cisco, it's between a class B and a class C, so it's 4,000. But anyway, they tell me the broadcast address right there. That's it, that's the broadcast address for our wireless network. So if I ping that, oops, I missed the five at the end. All right, now I get just one thing answering me, and I think it's the things of myself answering me is all I get. A couple of weeks ago, I would get hundreds of answers from every student machine connected to the wireless network. Anyway, if that happens, then one packet turns into hundreds of packets, and all you and a ping is not, there's no handshake in a ping. I send one packet, and it, so all I have to do is put the target's address in the source address of my ping. And I'll send a ping, and they will get 100 replies. And I'll send a ping, and they will get 100 replies. This is the general packet amplification attack. There are a lot of these. There are a lot of ways to make your one packet turn into bigger packets or more packets, and if you can cascade them, you can really make things bigger. And uh, Sabu was, while operating as an undercover FBI troll trying to trick people into doing crazy things, claimed that Anonymous could take down the whole internet. And I was one of the many people arguing with him that said, no, you can't. 
And he said, you could use DNS application to do it. And I don't think you could, and they didn't succeed in taking down the whole internet. There were some people that wanted to. Um, but anyway, um, you certainly can take down a lot of people, and there's many, many other packet amplification attacks that work like the Smurf attack, um, where you just have to find anything that doesn't have a handshake, and it returns a big response to a small, small packet. And there are a lot of things to do that. You, each D more showed how to do it. You never time protocol, and there's very commonly known DNS. There's just many, many people out there running servers that let people send a UDP packet and get a big response. And if you do, sooner or later the bad guys will figure out that you're just something, a resource they can exploit to take people down. So the main way you do this, just like that guy with his 420,000 routers, is you take over a bunch of machines illegal. You infect them with malware. Then you have a botnet. You control a bunch of people. A lot of people on botnets. All the people in Bullsec did the ones that um, claimed they were doing it for political protest. It turned out they were doing them running botnets to make money too, and stealing credit cards to make money, which is what a lot of people do in the counterculture. Um, and uh, once you've taken over all these machines, then you can attack from all those locations, and that's hard for people to stop because they get um, your traffic is coming in from many source addresses. So it looks just like a lot of real customers are trying to access your website. That's a real problem for people. Um, one thing that could help is if you recorded the actual IP addresses of your good customers, you could block everybody else for a while, and then at least your current customers could continue to get service. You will not let any new customers in, but that might be an acceptable compromise during an attack. So that's a botnet. You infect a bunch of machines, then there's zombies that are under control of a bot herder. Typically it's done with one command and control server or a group of them. Um, and that one server is what is used to order all the attacks somebody down. This is a very popular way to make money on the internet because you charge protection money. You contact those people and say, you went down three hours last week, that was me, and you're going to go down three hours again every week until you cough up 50 grand. And people will typically do it. It is far cheaper for companies to pay that amount of extortion than to mitigate the attack, or at least it was before Cloudflare. Now, anybody that doesn't want to knuckle under this can sign up to a free protection service that will stop. But a lot of people just continue to not do it because they just don't understand, or they have some strange religious objection to Cloudflare, but it's a lot better than paying a criminal, in my opinion. Anyway, so um, you can see the connections uh, on machines with desktop, which you've already seen there. So IRC is a uh, rich, was the early chat protocol. It was so people using Linux servers could chat with other people using Linux servers, and you could join the network, and the, the chat messages would percolate from server to server. So everybody could send text messages back and forth, and they had profiles and all that jazz long before it was popular on the World Wide Web. And this is, was immediately used for a variety of nasty purposes, the main one being controlling bondage. Um, so you would start a chat channel on your server and all the bots would join the channel and you would issue commands in the channel and that would control them. This technique does not scale to very large botnets. So if you want hilarious reading, I've got a link from a couple of years ago, but Anonymous did take down MasterCard. They had about three or 4,000 volunteers uh, participating in this criminal action to take down uh, MasterCard. And what they did was they got people to install a version of Low Orbit Ion Cannon that was controlled through an IRC channel so their master control server could take over your machine and help it use it to participate in the attack. And the result was it kept on crashing. And the chat channel is hilarious. Wait, I lost the connection. What's wrong with this thing? Wait, who are you attacking again? What's going on? Who wrote, they wrote this Brunton software anyway? It's hilarious to read. I mean, the stuff they used. This is why Nginx exists. Nginx is a super fast web server that's been growing in popularity, like I showed you, it's about number seven now. Nginx was originally written by criminals to control botnets. They needed something much faster than other software, and then adapted for legitimate serving web pages. It is much faster. You have to write something for the purpose of controlling a million machines. Don't just take something designed for a couple hundred and try doing it. You'll get in trouble. Anyway, so those are botnet attacks. Um, once your botnet has uh, once somebody's taking control of your machine, they can do anything they want with it. They can use your machine to send spam, launch DDoS attacks, they can put key loggers on it, um, whatever they want. The first thing they do, of course, is put on a root kit, then they own you, and then they can just keep using your machine for whatever they want. Um, so spoofing is another attack. The basic idea is where you pretend to be somebody else. There's two general categories. You can spoof the client or the server. So I can steal your Facebook cookie and connect to Facebook and get in your Facebook account spoofing you because they'll think I'm you if I got your cookie. Or I can put up a fake Facebook page that looks like Facebook but isn't and then send out a bunch of email and get people to click on it and go to my fake Facebook page and I'll get all their passwords. That's spoofing the server. And you can do either one because most internet pages have really no signature of any kind on them. You can just copy the page 
I put up a duplicate page and it's exactly the same. The only clue the user will have is that it's at a different address, but you can obscure that in a variety of ways. HTTPS connections give you some protection against talking to the wrong person, but um, not very ironclad. And this is why we have spam, because email does not check the from addresses. So you can send email and lie about the from address, and there's nothing to stop that. So people can just send millions and millions of emails, and nobody can find out who did that. Um, all right, so Express scans are uh, another type of scan you'll see in Nmap. Not all that important, really, but you can send, um, you can do beyond send scans, you can do scans with a lot of flags set in a sort of crazy pattern. Um, you don't really think it's much of an attack, doesn't hurt anybody, you don't really learn much from it. Man in the Middle is actually quite powerful, um, and we talked about how what you can do in the news. Uh, T-Mobile is right now vulnerable to Man in the Middle attacks for their Wi-Fi phone calls, and many people are vulnerable to Man in the Middle attacks. Anything that's not an HTTPS connection is pretty much vulnerable to Man in the Middle attacks. You think you're connecting to Yahoo, but it could be somebody in between you and Yahoo pretending to be Yahoo. The only protection you have against that is an HTTPS connection where there's a certificate that has to be signed by a third party. The problem is, if the certificate fails that signature test, your browser will just pop up a warning saying something's wrong with the certificate, and 99% of the users will just close that warning and go ahead anyway. Because those warnings pop up all the time for innocent reasons. The most common one is that Yahoo didn't bother to renew their certificate and it expired. People do that all the time. They got acquired by another company and changed the name and didn't buy a new certificate. That happens all the time. Or the clock on your machine is wrong, so it appears to be outside the valid date. So those boxes pop up all the time and are almost always um, false alarms. In fact, people say they're 100% false alarms because malware authors usually do not sign the site. What you can do is put up a Yahoo page that looks good but is not HTTPS. And people will connect to that, see no error message, and give you their data. So why would you bother to make a poor imitation of an HTTPS page or make an error pop up when you can just put up one that's HTTP only because most people don't know, they can't see it in the browser. It's getting kind of less obvious, too, because if you look at Chrome, Chrome doesn't even show you the HTTP there. The only way to tell if you're secure is you're supposed to know if I go to yahoo.com. This is not secure because that just shows a page, but if I go to, like, login, not is that new? I noticed that the other day, and I kind of like... Yeah, see, here's what happens. It turns green and shows you the HTTPS. When you're secure, it shows you. When you're not secure, it shows you nothing. So. And it's different in each browser. Originally, there was this padlock it would show, but most of the browsers have gotten rid of the padlock because all the bad guys just put a picture of a padlock on the page. <laughs> so it's a problem. And the studies have shown that very few people, as end users, have any idea whether they're on a secure page or not, and they also have no idea what that means either, which is what, you, what you'd expect, really. Um, so it's uh, kind of a weak spot, <laughs> a lot of weak spots. Anyway. So if you can get in the middle, you can do quite a few things. Now the next question, how do you get in the middle? The simplest thing is if you can physically interrupt wired traffic. You can get into somebody's server closet and move a cable to put your machine in the middle. But you, you usually don't have that luxury, so if you're at a coffee house, you just do it with ARC poisoning. You send out fake ARC replies telling people to redirect traffic to your MAC address and not the router's MAC address. And then all the traffic will just flow through you. Um, this works pretty much anywhere. Um, Unless somebody's running an intrusion detection system on the network, they'll never notice it. Iron Geek wrote a simple one called the Caffeinated ID that will notice when someone is doing this to you. So if you go to hacker conventions, you can tell when this is happening. At DEF CON, you can just assume this is always happening all the time. At the end of one of them, they quoted the statistics, and there were like 200,000 men in the middle attacks over a three-day conference. You know, so. Anyway, um, Kerberos also prevents this, logging into a domain or something. It uses, it uses a system of shared secrets to prevent that. So as a self trip is uh, Moxie Marlin's bike's tool to do this, which is really good fun. So if someone's trying to go to Gmail, this, got, this is how they got in my Gmail account at DEF CON. Caught my attention. Um, so, um, was it this one? No, I'm sorry, it wasn't this one. It was the one where they stole the cookie. However, this will get in almost anybody's account. Because what you do is, first you get in the middle with our poisoning, or any other technique, and then you connect to Google with over HTTPS, and you hand the page to this person over HTTP. So they will have an insecure channel to here, and you'll have a secure channel to there. So you put up the login page, they log in insecurely, now you have their real password, now you log in up there for them. These guys have no way to know that you're not the right person. You get the data and pass it back to them. They will see their page, they'll be able to update their page, and everything, but you're getting everything. 
The only clue they have here is that should have been HTTPS, but it's really HTTP, and so unless they're sharp enough to notice that, they're toast. Um, really quite powerful. Now the only defense against that is if you go to the page originally typing HTTPS in the browser, Facebook.com. If you type it that way, then it will not accept the original connection. But if you go through an HTTP page that forwards to an HTTPS page, SSL strip can intercept that forward. And almost everyone does it that way. If you type in gmail.com, it will forward to HTTPS mail.google.com, and therefore if someone is SSL stripping you, it will go to HTTP mail.google.com, and you won't know. Yeah? Similar to a replay attack? No, it's not. This one is different than replay. This one actually steals all your data in progress. This one lowers your security. This is a downgrade attack. You have a secure connection, and it downgrades it to an insecure connection. There are a whole series of these that, um, for example, there are um, a lot of security certificates on the web that permit you to use old protocols. Like they should be using 128-bit encryption, but they will permit you to negotiate down to 56 or 40-bit encryption because you tell them, I'm sorry, I'm using MS-DOS. And they haven't upgraded their certificates. So if you pretend I'm a really old machine and I really can only do 40-bit encryption, they will let you negotiate down to that. There's a fairly, that's a downgrade attack. There's quite a few of these. Because, um, anyway, a replay, that's the one here. Replay is where you record packets from one, from your real user connecting to the system with Wireshark or anything, and then you replay the same packets to get in. And this, to prevent this, people should be using challenge handshake protocols where it sends you a challenge, you edit your password and hash that. And next time you log in, it'll send you a different challenge. But the problem is people want to be logged in all day. They want to log in Facebook and go back and comment all day on Facebook and they want to be logged in on their phone and their tablet and their <laughs> PC all the time. So they just give you a cookie and you can use the cookie to connect as many times as you want and it'll always know who you are. There are secure cookies. You could just put a bit in the cookie that says transmit this cookie over HTTPS, but people just don't bug. So you just steal the cookie and be them all day. Um, there's plenty of measures to protect against it, but they never have become popular, even though you know, ridiculously obvious tools like FireSheet that came out more than a year ago at TorCon, where you could just go to Starbucks, turn this thing on, and just see everybody's connection. And you can just be this person, be that person, be that person. You don't even need to know what you're doing. Ten-year-olds can do it. But uh, most of these guys didn't do anything about it. Facebook did something, and Twitter has done some stuff, and Gmail has done some stuff. They're making some progress there, but a lot of online services don't have any clue. So there are other things that can go wrong with your web browser. One of the nastiest things is malicious add-ons. Um, Java is essentially malware in the first place, as we talked about, because it's always so vulnerable. But there's also add-ons that just lie to you, like half the machines in the lab have some stupid ask toolbar or something on there. Um, that is, it, and you can write add-ons that will steal passwords and everything else in, in um, Mozilla, because you can just put any add-on you want. Um, the cookies stored in your machine are a couple of different concerns. One of the most common concerns is people don't want to be tracked. They don't want someone else to know everything they're doing. And DoubleClick, which is now owned by Google, puts cookies on your machine and keeps track of everything you do. So every single website you go to has a DoubleClick item, and it sends a DoubleClick cookie up to identify you, so Google knows who you are everywhere you go, even if you use a different browser. Even if you delete all your cookies, they do it by your IP address, because that is their entire business model, is to know everything everybody is doing. And they are very, very vigorous about it, and they have thousands of very intelligent PhDs thinking of ways to hide more information, to keep track of who you are at all times. Um, so it's very difficult to overcome. That's, that's one issue. It's, the other thing is pe some people actually write cookies that contain private data, like your credit card number or your password. Now that is an incorrect use of cookies, but there's nothing to technically prevent it. Cookies should just be a long random number. And there should be a table on the server so they know who you are based on that number. That's what some professional people like Amazon or Google will do. But sleazy websites that roll their own could just put your name and password or your credit card number right in the cookie. And that's typically transmitted insecurely. So it's an unsafe thing to do. And the replay attacks I've talked about. So there's session hijacking. The old-fashioned session hijacking that Kevin Mitnick did in the 90s was to inject packets into a TCP session by predicting sequence numbers. So if somebody would log on with FTP and you then inject packets and take over their session after they log on. Become them. That's a little bit complicated. The new version is replaying authentication cookies to hijack a session and you see that works just fine. Take over somebody's session, very easy. This is called cross-site request forgery which is impersonating a person across a site. This person tried to connect from their machine, you stole their authentication information and used it over here on a different machine. That's the cross part. You've taken something from one session and used it in another session, but unless they have protection against that in the mathematics of the cookies, you can get away with it. And it totally works for most 
And that is how they got into my Gmail at DEF CON. They got in there with cross site request forgery by stealing the cookie. So here's how you do arc poisoning. So arc is if I try to change the routers over here, and they say, yes, sir, whatever you say, the router's over here. The only thing missing is when this was all designed, nobody thought about malicious, malicious hackers, so they didn't bother to put in a password or token or something to identify the authentic router. So that's, that's arc poisoning. What people are trying to do is go to the gateway and go to the internet, but because you lie and tell them every gateway, they send it to the attacker, and the attacker can forward it on. So they do get service, although often you can notice it's slower, and the attacker can now intercept all their packets and read anything they have to say, if it's not encrypted. So another thing you can do is you can just send out ARC packets that send the traffic to some place that doesn't exist, and then you've created a denial of service, a very simple one in the network. Nobody can get to the internet on that network as long as you keep doing that. All right, uh, VLANs uh, limit the damage of arc poisoning because you remember they sort traffic to layer two. So if I send out packets that are broadcast, they're only going to reach people on my VLAN. So if I started running an attack here, I would only get the seated department. I wouldn't get the financial department or the grade department or anything because we're on a separate VLAN from the rest of the college. So that does help. Um, domain names are often used in attacks, for example, command and control servers have domain names. You can, until recently, a lot of people let you buy a domain name, use it free for five days, and then cancel it. So the bad guy could just do that. Buy a domain name, use it for five days, let it get canceled, and have an endless chain of them. Now a lot of people no longer give you the five-day free period, so they actually have to go to the bother of taking one of their stolen credit cards and pretending to pay for a domain. But, they really haven't. but that's a game here. They call this kiting. Kiting is sending something up that's going to come down. Check kiting is the old game where you have five checking accounts, so you pay off this loan with this credit card, and you pay off that one with this credit card, that one with this credit card. You never actually have any money, but each one of them thinks you have money for a short period of time. Um, so I got a few like other questions. So which of these is an infected computer? All right, that's a zombie. All right, human criminal. That's the herder, of course, is the human. And which one of these will redirect traffic? Start poisoning. Yep. Redirect traffic at layer two. So which one of these will reduce the effect of our poisoning? VLANs, of course, limit the damage you can do. Like I can redirect traffic, but I can't redirect it out of my VLAN. So if they just make a whole VLAN low priority, low importance, like the senior department, then they protected the checks and stuff from this kind of attack. So a protocol used to control botnets. All right, that's IRC. Maybe that relay chat. People thought they would give this up and use more complicated protocols years ago. There were plans to make peer-to-peer -peer protocols and encrypted protocols, and it turned out to be too much bother because the criminal couldn't, like, charge for their botnet and take you know, how many who were using their botnet. So they just stick with the old tried and true good enough in most cases. So maybe I can get through some of the securing applications. We'll see how it works. So you have applications. Remember the server itself, if you have a default install of Windows or something, it's not very safe. So you turn off unnecessary things and change passwords, which Microsoft has done for you a lot in modern versions. Then there are guidelines for each uh, application to tell you about this. If there are back doors, you can get rid of them. These are things vendors put in devices. Uh, Sometimes vendors forget to take them out before they ship the devices and they have a secret backdoor account. This recently came out that Barracuda has secret backdoor accounts in all their hardware uh, spam filters. Um, and if they do, you want to get rid of those. So the software development life cycle is a technique of writing secure software. Microsoft champions this. And there are various ways to do it. The waterfall is the most common one. There are other ones here where you go through a whole series of steps of review. So the point here is you're going to review the source code at many different stages. You're going to consider security right in the original design. And again, later and later, you're going to keep auditing things and checking for security and testing it. Um, the best test is external experts because, as like I was saying about that person that wrote the article full of accusing the wrong person, I've learned if the person who did something stupid is not the person to ask, is there anything stupid in here? I mean, they obviously believe what they did is right. You need to have somebody outside look at it if you really want to find the mistakes. Um, so input validation is an important step. Before any, anything that comes from the user should not be trusted. You should make sure it doesn't have malicious content like it's too long or it contains uh, dangerous characters like uh, less than signs and greater than signs and so on. Um, that's the main uh, 
way you protect yourself from a wide variety of internet attacks. Um, another thing that happens a lot is default installations of web servers will just tell everybody exactly what's wrong every time there's a problem. They'll tell you what version of SQL you're using, what version of what SSL you're using, and that's unnecessary information to hand out, so you should customize your stuff to not tell users technical details they don't need to know. They should just say, there's been an error, please try again, or something like that. Um, so these are things you could have prevented with input validation. Buffer overflows only happen because you put a lot of data in something that isn't intended to handle that much and you forgot to check. SQL injection only happens because you permit people to put in SQL commands when they should have just been putting in the name and password. And cross-site scripting involves letting you have a field that's supposed to have something like text to put on a Facebook wall and you let people put in HTML tags that execute them. All these come from letting people put in appropriate input in. And you can remove them by filtering the input. So there's a lot of server attacks. We've talked about the web servers before. Apache is the most popular web server because it's free and small businesses mostly use Apache. Big corporations use IIS because they're typically all Microsoft shops because they want those domain controllers and cross scores, trusts, and all the fancy things that come with a Microsoft domain. If you do run a Microsoft domain, you want to use as much Microsoft software as possible because it will all work together better than using Apache. Nginx is the up and coming number three um, it's becoming more and more popular because it's a lot like Apache, except much faster. Um, so buffer overflows, if you reserve a certain amount of space for a variable, and then the attacker puts in something much longer, like a thousand characters for a name, then you get a chance to override parts of memory where you're not supposed to be. And I think i got some pictures of this coming up. Yeah. So here's, if you have an old version of Windows, like before Windows XP Service Pack 2, it actually worked this way. You'd start the machine, it would take the, you have four gigs of RAM here, it would take the first portion of RAM and put Windows in there. Next portion would be whatever else you're running, antivirus, IIS, SQL Server, would just be stacked up like blocks here. So that means if somebody writes an application where it takes in a name or a credit card number or something, they, make, they set aside room, store 10 characters of name, but when they put in the name, they forget to make sure I only gave them 10 characters, so I give them 1,000 characters. So the name overrides the space reserved for name, the space reserved for other variables, for other variables, and goes up here and allocate and changes parts of the stack which are going to be written onto the registers when it returns from a subroutine. So you're, there's two important things you have to hit here. You have to hit the instruction pointer. This is what's going to control the next execution to be in, the, the next instruction to be executed. And the next thing you have to do is get it to execute that egg way up there. The egg is a little piece of machine code written to call back your IP address and give your remote control to the machine. That's, and it's only about 56 bytes long. And you can get them from Metasploit. Metasploit will create them for the hardware you're attacking. So you want to execute this egg. You put a whole bunch of no operation commands here just to make it easier to find the egg. And you find the instruction pointer. And what you have to do is jump. In this, you have to put the memory address of your egg. Or anywhere in the NOP sled. Because if you hit anywhere in the NOP sled, it will just do nothing, 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 and then commit the egg. So you put a couple thousand bytes of NOP in there just to make it easier to hit your egg. Because the problem is you have to figure out where that is in memory and you don't really know where you are. But you can guess where you are because you can guess that this is all that happened. Windows is running, this is running, that's running. So you can guess IS is probably pretty much here. It might be a little bit up and down and hopefully your NOP sled will cover that, that mistake. So if you're able to get all this stuff work correctly, you gain remote control of the machine. This is where you take it over through a buffer overflow. If you foul this up, and you put the pointer in the wrong place, so it just hits some random part of memory, it will just crash, and that's denial of service. So a sloppy buffer, a floppy buffer overflow creates denial of service. A precise one gives you remote control of the machine. And there are some mitigations we're mentioning here. Here's the canary value. This is what a bunch of Linux does. It puts a special value at the end of the registers that should never change. And if it ever, when it, when it returns from a subroutine, it checks, and if the canary value is changed, it says, forget it, stack smashing detected, something overrode the stack, I'm not going to continue executing. So you don't get to execute your code. That's one simple um, protection. Another protection is um, address space layout randomization, which came out with Windows XP Service Pack 2. Every part of the operating system, every application is randomly spaced in memory every time. So you have no idea where IS is. It could be here, it could be up there. Unfortunately, they implemented it in a terrible way. They only used one byte of random number. So there are only 256 possible places it can be. So all you have to do is run your attack 300 times and you'll get in. But at least it provides some mitigation. Is that, uh, like, is that heap? What's that? Is that a heap spray? A heap spray is uh, a different part of memory, but it works about the same way. 
keep is for temporarily allocated things during uh, execution. And the stack is for things called when you call server change. But it amounts to the same thing. Now, the other thing is data execution prevention. This is available on most modern motherboards. Your processor can mark parts of memory non-executable. And then you can store variables in there, but you can't ever execute code. And now even if you do inject your egg and you can point to it, it won't run. So that's another big hammer to hit this kind of problem with that cuts down the likelihood of cheating the buffer overflow. So, I like your questions. Those are good defenses, by the way. They're very effective. It's very difficult to take over modern versions of Windows. You have to overcome all those defenses. And there are ways to do it, but it gets more difficult. So, which is the countermeasure to prevent buffer overflows? So, that's ASLR. Whoa. Oh. Well, see, it, I got some winners. <laughs> so, no. That's right. So, address, none of the rest of these protect you. This is what protects you. Address space layout randomization, where you run everything in a different part of memory every time you execute it. That makes buffer overflows less likely to succeed. All right. Well, how about this one? Small program to connect back to the attacker. All right, that's the egg. The egg is the active ingredient. All right, the most popular web server. All right, that's IIS. Oh, excuse me, Apache, pardon me. Apache is the most popular, IIS only for big companies. A command that does nothing. That's not, no operation. 